Kia ora and hello everyone. My name's Evie O'Brien and I'm the Interim Executive Director at the Atlantic Institute. I'm thrilled and honoured on behalf of Rhodes Trust, the Atlantic Institute, Obama Fellows and the Schmidt Science Fellows who are all our Fellowship of Fellowship partners to welcome you all to our third webinar, Conversation on Displacement. A special welcome to our speakers. We're thrilled that you have honoured us with your presence and also a really special welcome to our Rhodes Scholars-elect. Our webinar series intentionally uses the word new with K in brackets in front of it to acknowledge that each and every one of us brings resilience, solutions from known experiences of our own or that of our ancestors. The world has been here before, and one of the roles of all of us as leaders is to remember and to bring that into the space. To this end, I respectfully ask that we all take a few seconds to remember those across the world who have lost their lives to this disease. As many states and countries around the world begin to open their borders, we were reminded only earlier this week of the day of the greatest number of new positive tests for COVID-19, 106,000 people across the world in one day and the continuing harrowing consequence that this disease is having in many countries across the world. So if we could just take a few seconds to remember those who have lost their lives and to remember their families who weren't there to provide them comfort. Thank you, everyone. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Tanya Charles, who is an Atlantic Senior Fellow from the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity, London School of Economics. We're also honoured to have Tanya as our Senior Fellow Engagement Lead at the Atlantic Institute. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much, Evie, and welcome once again to everybody on the call from wherever you are, hoping that you're safe and well. I'm so excited and really pleased to host and moderate this webinar which is focusing on displacement. As an immigrant myself, I'm home to multiple countries across the world. The notion of home is very perplexing, especially now when we are being called to stay home, to shelter in place. For many of us, home might be broken. Home might not even exist for many of us. Home can even be a distant place. Home can actually be multiple locations. So we are really trying to unpack this notion of home particularly for displaced people. And we have an exciting international panel that's really going to help us to do that. And it's my pleasure to welcome and open with the first speaker, Zalasht Halamzai. Zalasht is the director and co-founder of Refugee Trauma Initiative, an organization committed to resourcing refugees, aid workers, an organization with the skills and tools to deal with stress, insecurity, and trauma really pivotal. A former refugee herself, Zalasht has been an advocate for refugee rights over the last 12 years, and she's developed programs that promote resilience in vulnerable populations in several countries, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey, Syria, the United Kingdom, and Greece. Zalasht has trained in childhood and adolescent counseling and psychotherapy at Cambridge University, and she's currently pursuing a master's degree in mindfulness based in cognitive behavior therapy at Oxford University. She is multilingual and was selected as the Catherine Davis Peace Fellow to study Arabic at Mildenbury College in 2016. Zalash has also written for several publications, The Guardian, Washington Post, and she was also the recipient of 2017 Future Shapers Award from Marie Claire magazine. We're also delighted to host her as a 2018 Obama Fellow, one of the first chosen from over 20,000 applicants. We are really honored to have someone who's not only spent their lives living and working with immigrants, refugees, and displaced people, but can share from a lived experience as well. I invite you now, Zalash, to open this with your thoughts on the topic tonight. Thank you. I am so delighted to be here and I'm really grateful to the Atlantic Institute and the Rhodes Trust for organizing this and really grateful to all the participants that have joined this call. I wanted to start what I'm going to say with some messages from the refugee community in Greece. These come from people that we've spoken to in recent weeks. 
we can go out once a day. There's no building around us. It's just plain. It's nothing. Camps are in far places, far from any human being. They're not close to Greek civilization, so it's painful. Sometimes I feel very hopeless and disappointed. It feels like we are on another planet, like we are not alive. I miss the seaside. I want to see a sunset again. These are unexplainable things. Grief is an experience I can never explain. Refugees suffer from poverty and hunger. Now he's facing another crisis in his life, which is a crisis in the world. Imagine how it will affect him and his body. The sense of fear is very high. Discrimination is running very high and makes it more difficult in the situation. I have trauma in my life. When I was living in the camp, I moved around, didn't think too much about what came before. Since I came into this apartment, I keep recalling. I watch videos to not think about memories, to have a distraction. These messages come from conversations that me and my colleagues have been having with people around Greece. Since the pandemic started, we invited people from the refugee community and from the aid workers community to take part in in-depth conversations so that we can create spaces where they're hard, so that we can try and shed light to the day-to-day lived experience of people that are either displaced or trying to respond to the crises that are happening in Greece. The conversations have been incredibly difficult spaces to be in. And they're often revealing this nightmare scenarios for families, for children, and for young people, scenarios that they have to contend with day to day. The situation for Greek refugees was really difficult before the pandemic began. Before the crisis started, the rise of the far-right rhetoric led to a number of attacks on refugees and aid workers. There was a hostile government policy and lack of basic services, including shelter, food, and healthcare. These were all putting extreme pressure on the refugee population in Greece. Just weeks before the WHO declared COVID a pandemic, the situation in Evros, which is the Greek-Turkish land border, exploded. Tensions were growing over the EU-Turkey deal, and the Turkish government started busing what is believed to be thousands of people to the border. As they arrived, they were stopped by the Greek border guard. And we started hearing reports of people being shot as they tried to cross the border. The government responded by swiftly stopping any kind of application and denying people the right to seek asylum. And so this created a huge amount of anxiety within the refugee community about their future. COVID arrived in these circumstances. I recently spoke to a young Afghan man who's stuck in Moria. This is the notorious camp on Lesbos where they, despite having the capacity for only 2,700 people, there are 18,000 refugees currently there. Some of the things that we're hearing is that per toilet, there is something like 350 refugees. So it's an extremely difficult situation. He was feeling extreme anxiety because the camp has very little provision for healthcare. He's 26. He arrived in Moria last autumn. He arrived with his wife and a young daughter, a toddler, in fact. And the situation in the camp has placed such an enormous amount of pressure on his young family that his wife started to develop mental health issues that are so severe she's tried to harm their daughter. He's tried to seek psychiatric help, but no help is available. And he's having to make a choice between queuing for food to feed his family and keeping his daughter safe and his wife safe. He was in extreme distress as he was telling me this, saying that he just left a queue for food where he queued for almost three hours and only got some oranges and tomatoes and he really didn't know what to do with that. We're talking to the communities because we feel that it's really important to have their voices heard. The work that we do at Refugee Trauma Initiative is about providing psychological and emotional support to refugees. Our interventions are trauma-informed and identity-informed. A lot of our work focuses on bringing the identities and lived experiences of refugees into the space where we operate and really harnessing the resilience and the power that already exists in the community to help them heal. 
we also focus on building local capacity around the world. It's the local organizations that are doing most of the responding. So we're working with Greek organizations to help build their trauma-informed practice. We're doing that because the displacement crisis is so huge that the only way to meet it head on is to build a network of organizations that are working to meet the needs. What we've seen in our work is the COVID exasperated an extreme situation globally. 70 million people are displaced right now and 420 million children are living in conflict zones. So the physical and psychological safety of millions of people hang by a thread every day. The UN released a statement recently saying that there is a mental health crisis that is currently brewing all over the world. And that has all of us, particularly those of us who are working in vulnerable communities, really concerned. How will a young family, like the one I mentioned, stuck in a camp like Moria, fare in these uncertain circumstances? The Secretary General of the UN recently warned about a tsunami of hate, xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering unleashed by the pandemic, border closures, contact tracing and the economic crisis that's set to follow will be catastrophic for refugee communities and other vulnerable communities. So there's a real danger that the progress that we've made in establishing international systems of rights and conventions to protect refugees, children and other groups are going to continue to be eroded, putting the rights of all people in jeopardy. But like with any crisis, there are opportunities for betterment and transformation. And there's some really good examples of how countries are responding to migrants and refugees. Portugal and Italy have extended legal status and healthcare to migrant and refugees in this crisis. In the UK, there's a campaign that's being led by Help Refugees, bringing attention to the contribution of refugees and migrants to the National Health Service. And the fact that we're seeing how important essential workers are and who does essential work, I think could be a wake-up call to recognize the importance of these groups and their contribution to societies all over the world. But I think what we need is to get these stories out far and wide to help stimulate empathy and collective action. We're talking about a new world order in this webinar, and I think that's what's necessary to create that organized collective action to protect the rights of refugees and to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to reduce the threat to their lives. What's happening is born out of inhumanity, inaction, and xenophobia. We have the resources to extend the protection that they need. And I think if we don't, there's a real danger that the powerful few will eventually strip all of us of the protection that we currently enjoy. I think we're as safe as the most vulnerable people in our community. I wanted to finish on a personal note. I'm a former refugee myself, and I went through a very similar experience to those people in Greece at the moment. Despite setbacks, my family and I started a new life in the UK. We learned a new language, we learned new skills, and we found a new space to occupy in the world. This is something we all need to do now because of this crisis. There's such a wealth of experience and wisdom contained within displaced communities that we could tap into and learn from. And I think that by coming together and doing that and really harnessing that wisdom that's already there, we can come out of this crisis to a better place. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Zalash, for setting the tone for this discussion. It's really remarkable to think that at a time when we're supposed to be coming together, You have rising xenophobia, scapegoating, the nationalist sentiment really taking hold of the rights that have already been established for refugees and vulnerable people. But as you say, and you've reminded us, we are only as safe as the most vulnerable people. And I think that's something to bear in mind and that there are resources, whether in the legal framework, policies and laws already instituted to protect the rights of refugees. And with countries leading the way, including Portugal, Italy, and Jordan as well, where there was a rush to make sure that the safety measures, health measures were in place in those societies. So it's about continuing that good work. And we honor you for doing that work through your organization. Thank you so much. It's my honor and privilege to introduce a friend of mine, Dr. Gaba. We both went to the University of Cape Town many moons ago. He's, of course, now much more successful than I could ever dream. 
and I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud to introduce Dr. Faisal Gaba Mohabad, who is a lecturer in the sociology department at the University of Cape Town and affiliated to, I'll try and say this with the right accent, Institute for Zoology at the University of Freiburg in Germany. He was educated in both the University of Ghana and UCT, which I just mentioned. He's also the co-convener of UCT's Global Studies Program, which also leads the Migration and Inequality Hub in South Africa. This hub is the biggest migration project in the world, which looks at the intersection of mobility, inequality, and development in the global South. His teaching interests include African migration, livelihood structures, inequality and social change, as well as working class organization and struggles. He's conducted research in many parts of the world with African migrants in South Africa, Ghana, Germany, India, and the United States of America. Most importantly, he's also very passionate about community initiatives to integrate the struggles for dignity and decent lives for poor and working class. In fact, he says his research is primarily driven by the objective of putting systemic intellectual inquiry at the service of social intervention and social movements. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaba. I'll call you Faisal because you asked us to. We're very honored to have you sharing from the Global South perspective and really putting the story of African migrants at the center as well as your thoughts on the topic. I invite you now, Faisal, to do exactly that. I'm really grateful for the invitation. Thank you very much to Zanella and Lukman for facilitating this. I'm really happy to be here to share and learn collectively with you all. So I have been asked to speak about the situation in the region where I'm located. My region is Africa in its entirety, but I'm currently located in the southernmost tip of the African continent. So I'll briefly touch on the situation of displaced persons in select parts of Africa and then focus on South Africa. Many people across the African continent are struggling for food and other basic necessities as we speak. This is not something new, but it has been exacerbated by COVID-19 and the social dimension of the epidemiological crisis. Now, this struggle is particularly acute for displaced persons, i.e. those forced to leave their place of usual residence and turn into refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented persons and stateless persons. In the midst of COVID-19, displaced persons across Africa, like other categories of poor and working class persons, have very little access to healthcare, to predictable livelihood, and to social amenities ranging from housing through to education. At the moment, depending on what estimate one works with, there are about 25 million displaced people across Africa. Now, the bulk of those are classified as internally displaced people, or IDPs, meaning people who are uprooted from one part of their countries of usual residence to another part of such countries. Refugees and asylum seekers also make up a substantial population of displaced people, and most of them are hosted by communities that are otherwise struggling themselves. So there's a great deal of sharing that one finds in this zone of transition. I will spend some time talking about what is happening in South Africa before I move to the second part of my remit, which is how do we centralize displacement in thinking about an alternative future post-COVID. Now, South Africa has about 4 million mobile population from other parts of the world outside of South Africa. The bulk of this population is from the Southern African sub-region, and the population is largely made up of people who function in the informal economy, live in townships, and really experience very precarious socioeconomic conditions. When COVID was declared a major emergency globally, states began to take local initiatives to deal with the fallout. Now, in South Africa, there was a national lockdown that was declared. The national lockdown, as I'm sure we're all going through in different parts of the world, meant that various aspects of everyday life were constricted. And the state was therefore forced to roll out a relief package to take care of the most vulnerable of the national population. In South Africa, the relief package made provision for people who are citizens, but also for non-citizens who have legal residency. Now, this is very important. The requirement for documentation, in effect, denies many displaced people access 
to life-saving necessities such as food. But it also denies many locals with whom non-locals have very deep bonds of sharing and solidarity. In a sense, the relief package is administered on the basis of a very narrow understanding of the constituent basis of the society, but it also has a class dimension to it, in that for somebody born in a rural area who might be South African, but their parents live too far from the nearest medical facility or home affairs facility where they can apply for a birth certificate, they cannot prove their citizenship and therefore they cannot have access to food in this moment. Now, while this internal distinction is happening among people who really are in need as a result of state policy, the reality is the society is being held together in terms of people being supplied with the basic necessities that they need by groups of refugees and some undocumented people who transport food, who deliver medical supplies to houses in various settlements. Now, this disjuncture between social process and state policy actually has a serious implication for the future of COVID relief, but also the future of society as a whole. Because the policy of the state at the moment is incubating a zone of exclusion where there exists the likelihood of this disease spreading and therefore posing a danger to the entirety of the society. And I'll illustrate with a point. Last week, I was in a part of Cape Town where a lot of refugees and migrants have small businesses and some of them just hang out. A group of refugees that are known to me that operate a barber and saloon were standing in front of their salons. The salons were closed, but they were semi-open. What they do is look around and beckon at anybody like myself who has overgrown hair and they think needs some haircut and invite you to come to the half-closed, half-open salon. This is a salon without a window, so there's no ventilation. The likelihood of transmission is quite high, not just of COVID, but also of other diseases, given the reality that people have been indoors for such a long period of time. Now, the danger is that if this process continues and such zones become transmission belts, what will most likely happen will be a state-driven ordering of refugees and migrants as basically those who infect us. Now, related to this is the question of home as a metaphor, but home as an existing reality where people's dignity is preserved. Because many migrants operate in the informal sector as hawkers or doing what one calls any work, whatever is available to do. Many of them are unable to function and therefore do not have an income. A lot of migrants who straddle the space between refugees and undocumented people are currently facing eviction because they are unable to pay for rent. This means that COVID is not only posing a threat to their everyday existence, but it's actually rendering them homeless in a dual sense. So uprooted from their normal places of residence, having found a home here, and now they are about to be uprooted from this home also. The other dimension which is linked to this is some recent media reports that people who were homeless, who were not locals, who do not have citizenship, went to one of the temporary shelters that was set up. They were told they cannot have access to it because they are not locals. Now, you can imagine what this means, denying people access to a shelter at a time where people are supposed to be isolating themselves from groups. Now, why South Africa does not operate a camp system like other countries in the continent where you have refugees encamped in a closed zone, often a barbed wire zone? Lately, a group of protesting refugees here in Cape Town were relocated to a camp-like structure in the outskirts of Cape Town. Some of the reports that we've been getting from those people is that the conditions are really not optimal for any form of social distancing. This cumulatively lead to a situation where people's dignities are being vitiated, people's sense of self is completely affronted, and refugees are forced to engage in activities that are really dangerous for their own health, to the health of their families and those with whom they interact. And I want to conclude by looking at the question of how do we imagine a different kind of future that centralizes displacement in a post-COVID world? 
I think it's important to mobilize for a different notion of belonging, a different understanding of citizenship, one which takes account of everyday reality, of the fact that belonging is a process, of the fact that people who might be something else could transform who they are and become a part of society in which they were outsiders yesterday. And here, I'm simply trying to draw on the experience of the African continent, where mobility is so central to the formation of identities, but also to the structures of livelihood. So that the current bias towards sedentariness, which assumes that somehow people have to be rooted in a place like a potato or yam, really has no basis in how people live their everyday lives. And this really fundamentally calls on us, wherever we are in the world, to take seriously the place of Africa in the global political economy. Because the displacement that we see is largely driven by resource conflicts locally, by elite politics, but also by the extractive character of multinationals across Africa. So the DR Congo has a large displaced population in South Africa. And if you do a careful study of the reasons why many of these people left, It is directly related to the activities of the tech giants that today are making a fortune out of the fact that we can only have certain meetings on Zoom and so on. And the final thing I want to share is what I think are some of the outlines of a different kind of society that people are beginning to put before us at the moment. Many refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented people in South Africa today are alive because of economies of solidarity and sharing where individuals who own shops, individuals who are unemployed, be they locals or non-locals, pull resources together and try to help each other. But also groups of individuals committed to a different kind of society are spending time volunteering to provide food to people, but also to find out what exactly is happening in people's lives. And this is related to the need to imagine how COVID could be in my view, a groundwork for a different kind of society. And finally, I want to share because I think it's really important. There's a colleague and a collaborator of mine at the Gaston Berger University in San Luis, Senegal, Professor Mami Pendaba, who is doing what I think every university, every institution should be doing today. She and her students are basically turning COVID into a moment of a socially useful pedagogy. So they have dispersed themselves across Senegal, working with displaced population, but also vulnerable local population, to find out what exactly are the needs of these people, what do they know about COVID, and how can they be of use to them. This, I think, provides for us the outlines of a different kind of society that will bring us together in order to put some pressure on states to think differently going forward so that we can come out of this as a more humane world instead of the narrowness that led us here. Thank you very much. So many nuggets there, Dr. Gaba. You've given us such a landscape of opportunities to think about how we can move from the state of panic to action. And one of the things is that people are not rooted. And in fact, they never have been. Movement of people, globalization, such notions have been around for a very long time. And so how does COVID-19, as you say, help us to think about arranging society in a way that reflects the reality? against nationalism and instead towards the solidarity that you said you've observed in your work, where despite your nationality, communities are meeting each other where there is need and how states are disrupting that. Lots of food for thought there. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaba. Our final keynote today is Emily McDonald, who we are also very thrilled to have on our panel. Emily is a DPhil in law candidate at the University of Oxford a 2016 Tasmanian Rhodes Scholar, and her research focuses on protecting the right to leave and related human rights of asylum seekers, refugees, and other migrants when migration control is conducted extraterritorially and has been outsourced to countries of origin and private actors and international organizations. So she's really putting the spotlight on all the different institutions that work to either support or curtail refugee rights. Emily is also an Australian lawyer and co-founder and former director of Tasmania's first community legal center for refugees, asylum seekers, and humanitarian entrants. She's also at the Tasmanian Refugee Legal Service. That's what it's known as. Emily is also joining us as a Rhodes Scholar, Tasmanian University 2016, 
we are really honored to conclude with your thoughts, Emily, on this topic of displacement, of home, of rights, and indeed of safety. Emily, I invite you to speak now. Thank you so much. Let me say, first of all, that I'm really thankful to be part of this webinar and also to learn from the last two speakers and to see so many people here, including new Rhodes Scholar elects, joining to discuss what I think is a really critical topic. I think that we have a unique platform here to connect with each other and imagine what a new world would look like in the future regarding displacement and for refugees, IDPs, migrants, stateless persons that truly upholds their human rights and also their agency. So before I set out what this new world could look like from my perspective, I want to start by highlighting the restrictive trend that was already occurring pre-pandemic. A lot of countries often in the West, such as Australia, the US, use an array of tactics, including offshore detention, intercepting migrants at sea, returning people to unsafe places without any due process, denying everyday tourist and business visas and denying lawful mobility paths, even to seek asylum. And as a result, migrants are contained in their country of origin and en route. So in terms of thinking about freedom of movement pre-COVID, individuals from these countries were denied freedom of movement well before COVID. It's not just lockdown when you have no home. Some are already locked down and contained in their countries of origin and transit because countries in the West are preventing them from seeking asylum and preventing them from traveling. I've seen this in my work just across the channel in France, in Calais and Dunkirk, as well as in Palestine. And so what we have now with the pandemic is it being used as a guise and an excuse by such countries to harden their policies, to close their borders and engage in practices that harm and discriminate. So many have been left in overcrowded camps, informal settlements in Greece and in Cox's Bazaar, rather than evacuated. In places like Australia, where many people are on temporary visa status, including asylum seekers, they're excluded from government welfare packages and support. And obviously, we've seen that many countries have fully or partially closed their borders. At least 57 of them, according to the UNHCR, are making no exceptions for asylum seekers. We've seen the US rapidly expelling migrants back to Mexico, Central and South America under the guise of public health. In just two weeks, 10,000 migrants, including children, were expelled to Mexico. As we've heard previously, asylum seekers travelling from Turkey to Greece have been violently pushed back using tear gas, live ammunition, and the Greek government has also been rounding up asylum seekers living in Greece and forcibly expelling them to Turkey. There are hundreds of migrants that are currently stranded at sea. Italy and Malta have closed their ports and won't let migrants disembark, and all NGO search and rescue operations have ceased. Malaysia turned back a group of Rohingya asylum seekers who drifted at sea for two months and 30 people died. But alongside this, and not wanting to focus only on the negative, there have been wonderful responses and interventions that we've already heard discussed that really respect and protect displaced persons, their rights and their well-being. And I think this is what we should focus on in these difficult times. We've seen the release of whole groups of immigration detainees in places like the UK, Belgium, Spain, Netherlands, Zambia, Thailand, Peru, to name some. And, you know, we need to reflect on whether we should even be re-detaining them when this is over. Should we be using immigration detention as a standard way to deal with people who are seeking asylum? And as mentioned, Portugal has really modelled an excellent and inclusive approach. They've granted temporary residence to all immigrants with pending applications, which extends to asylum seekers, really putting them on the exact same footing as citizens. We have seen children evacuated from the Greek islands to join family in the UK. Unaccompanied migrant children from the same hotspots have been taken to Switzerland, Luxembourg and Germany. This really just needs to happen on a much more widespread scale. Worldwide, we have refugees, asylum seekers and other migrants on the front line fighting the pandemic as nurses, doctors and other essential workers. And we finally have refugees being able to use their skills. In my mind, it's ridiculous that they weren't able to previously. So refugee doctors can now practice with their existing certification in Germany. And in the UK and Spain, they're having their certification and their recognition fast-tracked. While in other places like France, refugee medical professionals can now work to support medical staff. And as Dr. Garber pointed out, refugee-led organisations and refugees are mobilising all over the world to fight the virus. They're distributing food, soap, providing legal support, 
serving as health workers. So before I conclude, I just want to outline what it would look like for me if we bring displacement to the centre in engineering and imagining a post-COVID world. For me, and personally, based on my research, we would shift the narrative and dismantle the system that is built on exclusion, discrimination, fear and xenophobia to one that's built on integration, equality and inclusivity for refugees, asylum seekers, IDPs and other migrants, however you define them broadly. We would acknowledge, as the pandemic has clearly shown, that the vulnerability of some is the vulnerability of all. We're all part of the same community and everyone needs the same access and equal access to healthcare protection services, regardless of immigration status, regardless of their nationality, race or gender, along the whole migration path. We need to recognise the contribution and value of migrants and refugees. They've been part of the solutions during the pandemic and they've been our essential workers. We need to work with them as equal partners and ensure their voices are amplified. I'm so happy that Zalasht is with us today because it's not people like me who need to be speaking. It's really ensuring that the voices of refugees and migrants themselves are amplified. And it was incredible to hear her talk about the powerful experiences of refugees in Greece. And I think this is an incredible contribution. We've seen how everything can change really drastically and rapidly. Paradoxically, COVID has given people like myself a taste of the containment that many migrants from the global south experience day to day. We too have been rendered immobile, locked down, separated from our families and friends. We see how hard it is to be confined, to be told when and where we can move and what's essential. I really hope that this experience makes us more compassionate, more understanding towards asylum seekers, refugees who also have their lives uprooted in a second and makes us realise that our governments must not and cannot, in order to comply with international law, discriminate and routinely curtail the freedom of movement of not just asylum seekers but migrants generally. As well, of course, we need to make sure they're not obstructing the search for safety, the search for protection. COVID will lead to new waves of displacement. This is inevitable. There'll be a rise in conflict, a rise in hunger and a rise in poverty. And it's more important than ever that we work together now to protect the most vulnerable in our societies. And so to fight and overcome COVID, we actually need true global solidarity, collaboration and responsibility sharing. Globalism, not nationalism. And while this is focused on COVID, these are the exact same tools that are needed in terms of displacement and tackling refugee crises. I think this is what will lead us to a better future for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really touching. I actually found myself tearing up. It's really, really thoughtful and powerful commentary that you've given us. I think what struck me is how it is the migrants who are actually pushing this virus at bay. As carers, two weeks ago, we had a webinar featuring AJ and Poole, who's supporting domestic worker rights in the United States, including those of undocumented people still continuing in the face of great difficulty. And so thank you for bringing that into the discussion. And then also really thinking about imagining, shifting narratives is a core part of our work, especially as fellows of the Atlantic program and the many other programs on the core, where we need to shift from this idea that migrants or undocumented people are valueless, that in fact they have much to contribute to society. They have been and are already doing so. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective, Emily. Zalash, you had a really interesting comment to share around what are the parallels of the experience of the pandemic to the experience of displacement? There's so many parallels. I think the disruption that the pandemic has caused to people's lives, that's very similar to what happens when people are displaced or when your life is interrupted by a conflict. I spent quite a lot of time working on the Syrian conflict and I have friends who were just about to graduate from a course that they had poured their life and soul to and they couldn't, or a member of your family dies and you can't be by their side. You are forcibly disconnected from that. Mm -hmm. You lose your livelihood. There's so many parallels and it's an opportunity to find that connection between human beings. One of the things that we talk a lot about is who feels pain in what way, because there's a hierarchy of pain around the world. And mm -hmm. we try and bring people's attention to the fact that if you lose your livelihood in Afghanistan or in Syria, if you lose a member of your family, it feels the same way as it does in Oxford or London or Spain or one of these places. So I think there's an opportunity right now to really connect that 
that humanity and show that we are genuinely in this together. And if we can't find bridges to connect, then we're in trouble. Absolutely. One of the key words is connection, community, solidarity. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of this webinar and I'd like to invite Rudolfo from the Rhodes Trust. He's the global engagement manager to share his final thoughts and the closing and a thanks to the speakers. Thank you very much to everybody. Just to remind you that we'll continue our sessions with a webinar on mental health. Thank you very much.